Welcome to episode 78. Today's offering dips back to March 17th and 18th of 1996. Based on birds, callers, and guests in this installment, I have titled it Mystery and Magic. The producers are Mike Cannon and Tom Howie. 18-year-old Mike training 22-year-old Tom during a time of revolving door producers on the show, which Norm explains so well during a call. We begin with Norm riffing on a few subjects. I think we have a moment here where Norm is waiting for calls and is just going through news and info. I found it especially comforting just listening to Norm shuffle papers and tell us little stories and factoids from the wires. Simply soothing. St. Patrick's Day, birds migrating, the swallows returning to Capistrano, and Motown returning to Detroit are talked about here. We take some very interesting calls. Ruth Clennett gives us her review of Mr. Holland's opus. Now Norm, you see, you know, you see, has not been able to see many movies as he's an advisor to the president as well as the State Department. He does a lot of traveling around the world putting things in order. She talks about community auditions, where she was the auditioner, if that's a word, for 25 years. Norm helps clear things up when Ruth inquires about someone featured in the movie. She also talks about Riverdance. This, of course, was the early phase of the Riverdance phenomenon. She also said she heard Norm and I talking to Robert from Everett the previous night and was wholly entertained. Norm? Yeah, not so much. And their banter closes with a job offer for Ruth. The next call is from June in Brookline, sidewalk game reporter and observer of the American scene. I will not give any more away as this is quite the call and I swear Norm is trying his hardest not to break out in laughter through most of it. After the call, we only hear the first few words of a commercial, but it is so appropriate. We now hear from Sarah, I believe, and learn about schlemiels and schlemazels and more Yiddish expressions. Mary Lou from Lowell, first time caller and thrilled to talk to Norm. We learn of Lord Briscoe, the Jewish man with the Irish brogue. Next up is Don, with lots of talk about trains. Then we get a great call from John in Allentown, Pennsylvania, lover of old-time radio and is majoring in radio and TV. This being a subject right up Norm's alley, he dives into it and wishes radio was like that again. John agrees and says it is with the dumb birthday game. That concludes our March 17th broadcast. We now cut to March 18th. Norm teases the upcoming guests. Steve Daly, author of Toy Story, The Art and Making of the Animated Film. And later, Charles Solomon, animation historian and author of The Disney That Never Was. Before that, we are joined by Lenny Sogola from Lenny's on the Turnpike. A few great stories are shared. Lenny driving down Morrissey Boulevard with an artist heading over to Norm's show in the early a.m. hours to hang out. Count Basie, the Turnpike Club, Norm's unpaid bar tab, and more. Lenny, still promoting jazz off and on, had something coming up with Grover Mitchell leading the Count Basie Band. They were going to be appearing at the Temple Emmanuel in Marblehead. They'll be dancing and refreshments, so don't miss it! Our next guest, who had no problem holding while the jazz talk was going on, because he's a jazz fan was Steve Daly, the staff writer for Entertainment Weekly and the co-author of Toy Story, The Art and Making of the Animated Film. Now, that's a book I believe I still have here in the vault. Toy Story was the first full-length animated film made entirely on computer. There's tons of interesting info on the whole process and story. We then turn to the next guest, Charles Solomon, author of The Disney That Never Was. There's only about 10 minutes of the interview here, and that's a shame, but it's still worth a listen. Episode 78, Mystery and Magic, begins now. Amazing, isn't it? People, most people can't figure out how birds migrate, how they know where to go. You know, and yet they, they do it. They migrate each, uh, each year and come back again. But what about like the buzzards, the turkey vultures that return to Hinkley, Ohio, as they do each May fi uh, March 15th? And the swallows that come back to Capistrano. Do you remember that? Do you remember that song? You old enough to remember the song? When the swallows come back to Capistrano. That's the day I promise to come back to you. One of the prettiest songs I think I ever wrote. Thank you. Anyway, San Juan Capistrano, one of the state's oldest towns. The summer house of Cliff Swallows. 
and the arrival of the birds at the end of a 6,000-mile migration from Argentina has been celebrated for generations on March 19th. But this time, I guess they came. Oh, the tourists are there now. But I guess they showed up in the the, the uh, they they showed up a little bit early. They showed up on the 16th. But but isn't that amazing? They they go from California to Argentina and back again. That 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 instinct that they have. The uh, bells of the town's historic mission have chimed to welcome them for the feast of Saint Joseph. But this year, local officials and merchants decided to observe Swallow Day early to accommodate weekend tourists. Oh, I guess the, the birds haven't showed up, only the tourists. <laughs> I should read these items all the way through before I, I, I throw them at you. It says, a spokesman for the mission says hardly anyone believes any more than the, uh, any more that the birds actually saw, show up punctually March 19th. This, oh, this morning, which, is a, which would have been Saturday morning, several swallows were spotted flitting above the mission. I guess they didn't all, a whole lot of them didn't show up, just a few. And maybe the bulk of them over the weekend. Oh, incidentally, I don't need to tell you that this is St. Patrick's Day, by the way. We'll talk about that as the uh, night goes on. And a very happy St. Patrick's Day to you always. Uh, I always like St. Patrick's Day for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a, it's a lovely, happy time of year. And it's, and it's a fun kind of holiday. And number two, it signifies it's another, uh, another signifying mark about the fact that spring is, uh, is, uh, is on its way. Uh, thank you just so very much. And let me see what else can I tell you about. I can tell you about a whole bunch of stuff. I'll tell you about those as uh, we go along. But meantime, I'd like to just flap some papers in your ear. Motown is returning to the Motor City. Remember the Motown sound? The, uh, a lot of the Motown groups, rhythm and blues kind of groups that originated out of Detroit. 24 years after jilting Detroit and moving to Los Angeles, the music company that once transformed artists from the city's housing projects into superstars is coming home. I mentioned this because we have a fair amount of listeners in Detroit who can hear us, and apparently they're going to... Detroit won't be the the main city for Motown music that it was in the past because they moved out to Los Angeles. But the new Motown president says that uh, Detroit will serve as the Midwest headquarters for Motown, and they'll, they'll, so they'll still be looking for talent in that area. I don't know why I'm telling you this, because I don't know. I just it, When I started this, I thought it'd be something you'd be interested in, but I can tell the way you're looking at me, maybe not. Let me do the uh, weather and stuff, and then we'll take some phone calls. Okay, we have uh, just one open line right now. WBZ's extended AccuWeather forecast from Dave Bowers and his Motown Recording Orchestra. Clear overnight, brisk and cold, with the low temperatures about 26. Right now it's 27 degrees, and it is windy, and it, there is, it, it, just, it just hits you. After the lovely weather, it just really feels cold. Sunday, sunshine and a few clouds, highs 46. Sunday night, clear to partly cloudy, lows 30. Monday, a mixture of clouds and sun, highs 46. And Tuesday, mostly cloudy, becoming windy, with rain arriving later in the day. It may start as snow, highs 40 degrees. Thank you very much. I do appreciate your kind attention. And now, I'd like to lie down. Um, get silly. Ruth in the, in, hello. Hello. Hello, Ruth. Another new producer. Oh, uh, yeah, are yeah. You, are you doing something over there? No, what <laughs> happens is uh, we, we, new, new, uh, new young people are, are, are break in on this program because that's, I told you this is the bottom rung of the, uh, of the ladder. And as soon as they get to be really good at it, they're then transferred to another shift. I so I get I get all the uh, I get the train I I don't really train them personally but I get to be in on the beginnings oh, of their elaborate careers, and yeah. as soon as they know what they're doing they they they're, they're <laughs> gone so I get another badge <laughs> I should be saying this because the producer's looking at me and he he can he can detect that that's a dig 
Is he older than the last one? Uh, this one is 22 <clears throat> years old. And oh, yeah, I heard him the other night. Yeah, but he's being trained by he's being trained by an 18 year old. Yes, I heard him. Yeah, as soon as they get an age, uh, they'll do the David Brednoy show, and then I'll get a 12 year old <laughs> who's never been in a radio studio before. Anyway. Yes. I just heard the end of that lady's interview, and I want you to know I went to the movies alone today. Did you? Did you make a little notebook? And, and, and nobody stared at me. What can I do? But I'm giving you my Mr. Holland's Opus report. Okay. You, that, that's the movie you saw yes. this very day. You didn't see it, right? No, I want. I really want to see it. I want it, you to I, go I, and see it. You would love it. Uh, well, that's right, too. I said I want to see it, but I don't know that I want to see it till you tell me that. You will love it. You will love it. Really. A Wonderful. Lot of, a lot of, lot, um, more and more people have called and talked about that movie, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact. It, it, it actually it surprised me because a lot of the songs that they did play in it, which I didn't expect to see, especially Louie Louie. Remember that? Louie Louie? Oh, yes. It used to yeah. be our record hop song. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of the major songs. But, I, I, I mean, everyone's talking about um, Nicolas Cage winning the Academy Award, of course, for was it like, Leaving Las Vegas, which I didn't see. Did you see that? No, I haven't, I haven't seen much of anything. I haven't either. This is my first opportunity. and um, But he really should win the Academy Award from Mr. Holland's office because he just was wonderful. Just wonderful. And the person you're talking about is Richard Dreyfus. Richard I don't think we mentioned right. his name. Right, correct. I'm sorry. I'm not giving a great report. I'm tired tonight. Um, yeah, but it really was a very, very good movie. You will enjoy it. I, I wouldn't give it like a five, but i give it like a four. There's just a little things here and there and the Boston papers have only given it two and a half stars but what do they know right they don't know if they knew they'd be they'd be television people they'd that's be right. television critics that's right yeah but it also an interesting thing if anybody knows the answer to this question I wish they would call and tell you even though I'm your reporter yeah. a young lady in the middle of the movie I'm not going to give away the whole thing but the girl who sings the best I understand there was a write-up in some papers around here saying that she was on community auditions. Now, since I was the audition E for 25 years, I don't recognize her name. I don't recognize anything about her. And somebody else I know in Florida also said there was a story about her down there because her mother is living there or something and also said she was on community auditions and i want to know if anybody knows anything about that her name was something like susan something kelly susan with a middle name right. kelly and i have you know i mean after all i did you know if somebody sang as well as that young lady sang and i i did really audition maybe 50 60 thousand acts in my time but the ones who stood out you know i could name them all for you right now well i can tell you right off i can tell you right now why you didn't recognize her and she was on community auditions but she was under the name michelle Pfeiffer. no henry moscovich <laughs> she was a man at that time and has only become a woman recently and if you watched daytime television you would have known that on the ricky lake show Right. And any one of them, they all do transvestites and all of that stuff. Well, the thing is, though, she might have been four or five years old but at the time, because she looks about maybe in her 20s now. But even so, I, if she sang that well, you know, had a good voice when she was four or five, I think I have a pretty good memory. So anyway, if anybody knows, that would be good. Now, the other question I have for you is, yes. did you see on any shows this week a group called River Dance? I have not. Oh. I have to tell you, the other night, David Letterman started with David Letterman, and he said he was going to have this group, River Dance. Well, you know, he always has rock groups on and everything, and out came Irish step dance group of maybe, I'm not going to say it correctly, but maybe between 20 and 30 people from Ireland who had gone to England and did some shows there, and I want to tell you, in all my days, I have never seen anybody dance the way they did. They well, were I, I saw the promotion on that. Absolutely. I didn't see them on the show, but, oh. yeah, they were really hopping around at a oh, really brisk great. pace. And yesterday morning, they were on the Today Show, and they were out in the middle of Fifth Avenue or wherever they broadcast from there, and they, they, they said they've been at Radio City Music Hall this week, I'm giving you a good entertainment report, aren't I? That's wonderful. And they, uh, 
they are just doing standing room only business they did in london and here they're just absolutely magnificent mm. maybe uh girls in beautiful little costumes and and guys in black outfits and i've never seen anybody dance like that in my yeah. entire life i thought they were i thought the women were kind of attractive and kind of leggy which is really nice well it started off on david letterman's because he has such a big stage there with just a fellow and a girl and they danced for maybe two or three minutes by themselves and it was like watching ice skating on taps you know mm -hmm. kind of thing mm -hmm. and then they all joined in and david let the, it's the first time on the david letterman show in all the years i've watched it Every person in the studio audience stood up and applauded at the end. Mm. He got a standing mm. ovation. It was really great. Oh, my goodness. And are they appearing other places, do you know? Uh, that's all they said, Radio City Music Hall, because of St. Patrick. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, that's, that's good. No, well, that's, that's the answer then. Right. Oh, okay. So that was my report, and I heard you and uh, Tony speaking to Robert last night. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> you sadistic human being. Uh and that's my report. Okay, well, night. I appreciate that very much. I and want I you to go to the movies and see Mr. Holland's Opus. And I do. The... I do want to. I do want to see that. Uh, There's several others I've wanted to see too, and I just uh, have not uh, gotten to it. As you know, I'm an advisor to the president, and a, and a State Department, uh, you know, a State Department advisor also, and I do a lot of traveling around the world, putting things in order. Oh, and so I don't have, sometimes I don't have time to go to the movies. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, though, your Michelle Pfeiffer or Robert Redford movie is not getting very good comments. Well, I know that, but you haven't seen it yet, so I, I, don't, want, I don't want you quoting other okay, people. Okay, I'm just telling you, but I got I, the soundtrack. I got the, the new Celine Dion um, cassette this week, and she does the background music on and the songs are already number one in about ten days. Well, I think that's just so swell. The music from the movie. <laughs> I see. So we'll have to check that out very soon, and I'll call it in. Yeah, no, you, yeah, that's right. You don't need to quote quote other people. Here's the, here's the thing. I'm, I want to I want to brief you on this okay. thing, Ruth. You want to be uh, my entertainment reporter. Number one, don't quote other people until you've seen the movie, because I care for your opinion more than I do for theirs. Oh my God. Yeah, and that's a heavy responsibility, and I, I hope I hope you I hope you don't buckle on. Have you sent me a check? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> I work for Westinghouse. Oh, I've learned from them. I see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Well, bye. Bye. Okay. Let's go to. Let's see. How about June in Brookline? Hi, June. Hi. Uh, Hi. Norm. Norm is my name, and I'm glad to talk with you. How you doing? Oh, pretty good. Good. Thanks. What, um, can, what can I do for you? Well, I thought you might be interested in a game I saw someone playing today on the sidewalk. Um, it was uh, probably a BU student, 18 or so, uh -huh. female. Yeah. And she had a soccer ball that was encased in um, twine in and case. on a tether. A leash yeah. uh -huh. that she held in her hand. And so as she was uh, going along, she could kick it, and it wouldn't run away from her. Now, I don't know if, if this is on sale or if she invented it herself, but anyone who has a soccer ball could make, make well, one well, of those things for yeah. themselves. What was the point of the game, though, uh, besides kicking it and having it well, practice, not get away from her? I see. Practice kicking and, and uh, just going around kicking a soccer ball wouldn't get away from you because it's uh, or, tied to you. Yeah, or run into the traffic or um, you know trip anybody else on the yeah. sidewalk. I, I don't know. Somehow I can't get thrilled by somebody just kicking a soccer ball and would wow. Well, I thought there must be some point to a game somebody well, you could score young, points you with. Maybe enjoy kicking a ball. But. Well, I suppose so. If you've already kicked the ball so many times, it's not fun no more. Well, no, that's no, I don't know. Story. Well, no, maybe get somebody else to be at the other end and uh, kick the ball at them. And they'll kick the ball back at you. At least there'll be kind of a togetherness for a couple of people. But mm -hmm. just standing around kicking a ball all by yourself. No, not standing around as you're walking along, going from one place to another. Oh, I see. How, how, how long was this tether? Oh, let's see, five, six feet. Oh, I see. Not too far. Maybe. So I didn't get, so the ball didn't get away too far. Right. And as you're I walking see. along, you could you could kick it and. Uh, yeah, that sounds like fun. That yeah. sounds like fun. I may put that together, 
And each time when the news is on during the hour, when I can take a break, I may, as I go to the water fountain, mm -hmm. I can just kick a, a soccer ball. Or lot. even in the chair. <laughs> even while I'm here, that's true. I could, yeah, right, hold on a minute, let me check. I don't, yeah, well, I suppose we, there's, there's, uh, I'm kind of hedged in here by equipment and stuff. But I, I, we could probably find a place where I could just sit around kicking a soccer ball. You know, a few uh, years ago, um, I saw a little kid on one of those sidewalk tricycles made of plastic. Uh-huh. And his, his parent, I guess, his father, or, or a store, had provided it with, with a, um, like a broom handle at the back uh -huh. that the parent could, could hold on to. So this way, the child didn't um, go off the curve or run into elderly people or anything. Golly, could still ride ride his his or her little yeah. bike. Golly gee, because Joan, you are an observer of the American scene. Mm -hmm. Now one more thing. Yes. Here's, here's a game I invented for the sidewalk in wintertime. Yes. Um, uh, you take an icicle and break it in half so that you have two pieces, and then. You kick um, each, each, um, each one with with one foot, alternating feet as you go down the sidewalk. Instead of kicking one piece of ice, you have two pieces, and there's one for each foot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, June! The city game. <laughs> you know, any age can play who's steady on their feet. That's right. One size fits all. Mm -hmm. I gotta go, June. That is the. That is the silliest thing I've ever heard. Stop for a minute. Is that a Schlemiel is so clumsy that he knocks drinks over, and a Schlemazel is the person that the drinks fall on. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You've heard that. Yeah, uh, yeah I remember it now, but I, I was trying to think of it when, when the word came up, and I, I couldn't think of that joke, which I think is funny. But there's a book, Philip, Philip Roth I wrote a book on uh, on Yiddish, have you seen that? It's an encyclopedia of Yiddish, and he explains all these terms. I've got that at home, I, and I, I'm not very good at filing stuff, and I never can find things when I want them. But he's got a lot of that, like schlemiel, schlemuzzle, uh, uh, schlepper. Uh, schlepper, which is different than schlep. A schlepper is a... Uh, it's not a carrier. Not a, No, not a carrier. That's right. It should be, but it's not. But it's not. No, as a matter of fact, in Yiddish... There are a whole lot of expressions that, if translated literally, have nothing whatever to do with anything. Uh, there's a word, for example. Are you Jewish, by the way? You know Yiddish at all? Uh, well, I am, but I, I don't know. I really don't know Yiddish. No, I don't. I, I'm Jewish, and I don't know that uh, many phrases. But for example, uh, you hear phrases like "Don't don't hack me or a chinik," which translated literally means. Uh, don't hit me off the head with uh, with a with a pot. Right. But the but that doesn't mean that is not what it's used for. What it means is you know don't bug me with this loud you know, keep whining and and complaining kind of stuff. Right. Stop nagging. Yeah. Me. Stop stop nag. I think that's a better way to phrase it. But there are a lot of phrases. I would think that that's probably true in a whole lot of languages, where uh, it, it certainly is true in English where we have colloquial expressions that if trans you know if you if you, you that don't mean what they mean literally uh, they don't i mean they they used to express some other thought i'm trying to think of an english expression like that well a greenhorn i don't know yeah i guess i guess so uh, there may be some roots for all of that kind of stuff a greenhorn is somebody who's new and uh, hasn't uh, ex hasn't really become acquainted with the ways of a society as yet he's still kind of new to that society and it's kind of almost a, uh, almost like we call them a farmer or something like, which is not probably not fair to farmers, but I there are expressions. Seed, but but it, but I hate seed. Yeah. yeah. See, you have a better way of <laughs> summing things up than I do, <laughs> and, and this is supposed to be my business, and I'm really rotten at that. That's kind of, you're shaming me. No, I enjoy listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I appreciate that, Sally. But that's kind of funny. We'll have to have a whole program on. Yiddish, because I think maybe maybe because I, I, and I don't know the language. I really don't know it uh, well, but I know a few phrases, and those few phrases are so descriptive and so wonderful that I that uh, that it's it's kind of fun to use them. But you have to, and, and there's no way you can explain them. 
Right. Uh, and that, I'm sure that's, I know that's true in every language. There must be, must be some great ones in Irish and uh, in Gaelic, rather, and Italian and French that when translated don't seem to make any sense at all. Maybe some of your listeners will call in and tell us some. I think so, yeah. We'll be going off here in about 20 minutes. We won't have too much time, but maybe that would be a great topic for some night. We can, we can spend an hour or so just doing that. I think it'd be fun. Anyway, thank you for the joke, and I appreciate you filling in an area that I just uh, <laughs> that just went out of my head totally. Good to listen to you. Uh, thanks a lot, Sally. Bye-bye. Okay, let's go to Mary Lou in uh, Lowell. Hi, Mary Lou. Oh, I'm so thrilled, absolutely thrilled to be talking to you. Uh, oh, gee whiz, Mary Lou. Stop yes. that. Stop it. <laughs> I'm a first-time caller. I'm glad you called. Thank you. And I just wanted to tell you, I am a Polish descent myself. But when I was a single school teacher, I used to travel to Ireland during the summers, and it was my favorite place to vacation. Mm. And there was an uh, Irish um, Lord Mayor of Cork of the Jewish persuasion, and his last name was Briscoe. Briscoe, that's the guy. That's the guy. I couldn't think of his name. That's right. Yeah, that's right. R-I-S-C-O-E. I remember when he came to this country... It's kind of funny. We expect, we kind of stereotype people. And yet, yet whatever religion you are, you can live in any country. It's true that in Ireland, and uh, most people are, are Irish. I know there's the Irish and the Protestant problems and all that kind of stuff. But in, like in Poland, most people are Catholic. In England, most people are Protestants and, and so on. But, but that, that, that isn't, you know, exclusive. You can be English and you can be uh, Catholic, and you can be uh, you know that kind of Irish and be Cat and be Protestant. It doesn't usually happen. So you, so you can be Jewish and still be Irish. And Briscoe came here, and of course talked Irish because he was Irish. Mm -hmm. He had a brogue. He had red hair and the whole business. <laughs> and uh, and people were astounded by all of that. The fact that the, he he wasn't what you he wasn't a stereotype. Yeah, maybe I'm not maybe I'm not phrasing it quite correctly, but but they couldn't believe he was Jewish if he had an Irish brogue, and there's no reason why not. His, his nationality was was Irish, even though his religion was not. But that was his name. Was it Lord Bris, Briscoe? I thought they call him that or Lord something. Lord Mayor. No, but but Briscoe was his last name. I yeah. do re, I do remember that. Yep. And somebody told me that there was a mayor of 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 Rome at one time whose last name was the same as mine, Nathan. I, I found that hard to accept because there is no TH sound in, in Italian. So I don't know, you know, I remember I used to introduce an Italian language announcer, a, a very dear man, and he, he did the whole program in Italian. I would say, now here he is, here's your host. Um, I forget, his name was Solimane. Yeah, this is way back. And I'd, Signor Salimane, Mr. S you know, and then he would take it and say, Grazie, Signor Natan, because he couldn't pronounce the TH because that's, that's not part of Italian. So what am I talking about? Have you any idea, Mary Lou? I think I went off the track here somewhere. Well, I think in Gaelic, too, they don't pronounce the THs. In what language? In Gaelic. In Gaelic, yeah. they, they, they don't have a TH either, yeah. Mm hmm All I know is that, uh, yeah, I don't... I'm, I was thinking of a. Do they have a th in in Welsh? Welsh they have about the nine thousand letters. It's like a. It's like Denmark, Danish, you know. Unless you're born there, you never. Nobody can ever learn Gaelic, I don't think, or Welsh, or Danish. Those are such impossible languages to learn. But it's an interesting study, though. Anyway, I, anyway, I'm I'm rambling on in a really stupid, meaningless way. I appreciate you reminding me of Lord Briscoe. I, I'd forgotten, as you heard, I've just had forgotten about his name. And I think he was the one who was trying to switch the people or at least to get them to drink more milk. I think he was part of that campaign at the time. Maybe that's why he never got reelected. I don't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you very much, Marilyn. It's a pleasure to talk with Happy you. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you, too. Bye-bye. Yeah, one one is this morning is the one I guess with uh, Billy Bulger will be at the uh, in in South Boston with his annual St. Patrick's Day. They had an animated cartoon of a new train that's supposed to run to, from Boston down the Northeast Corridor. Yes. 
in um, Bombardier is supposed to make them. You know, Bombardier is, uh, made the trains for Montreal, and they also made the Arctic Cats and Mosquitoes. That's what their claim to fame. And mm. they made the LRVs for the Portland, uh, Oregon transit system and the new red line trains. Now, when are they supposed to be put into effect? Uh, 1997, uh, the, they have to electrify the Northeast Corridor. That's the only, that's one of the reasons why it's slow, because if you take a train, um, the electrification um, runs from New Haven all the way down to Washington. And when the, when the Northeast train gets to New Haven, they have to switch engines. Mm. And that takes anywhere from... They say half hour, but sometimes 45 minutes. They have to run an engine out of the, the yard, hook it on. Then they um, say if the train is, uh, I don't know, say 10 cars long, they tell everybody in the first two cars or the last two cars that goes up Springfield up that way. And they say if you're going beyond that, everybody get in the last two cars, et cetera. They... Uh, they do a lot of detaching cars. Like when you go west to uh, Chicago, when you get to uh, Rental Air, the train from Boston to Chicago stops and it picks up the cars that are coming out from New York City. People who want to go from New York to Chicago, their cars have to be detached in Rental Air to go west. Mm. When you're coming east, they do the opposite. They say everybody going to New York City and points get on the last two cars. So the train comes east from uh, Chicago to, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, to, uh, up New York State. When it gets to rental air, it detaches the cars. Mm. And the cars either hooked on a train from Albany down to, to New York City or a train from Toronto or Montreal. Do, do we have uh, a tracks that are in good enough shape to take a train going 150 miles an hour? No, they have to redo them. So so it's not just a question of a, of a, of a train that can go that fast. It's a question of having the tracks to be able to accommodate them. Yeah. Right? Is that, is that, is that, it sounds like a huge job to have to do that, is it? Yes, it is. It's, it's, it's especially in our quarter because I, um, I think the fastest trains in the North East, I mean, outside of Europe, I think they're in the Philadelphia area, uh, my sister used to live in Philadelphia. We took a train to Harrisburg, which is 104 miles away, and the train did it in an hour and 55 minutes. Mm. And those trains were in Philadelphia. They have the fastest uh, rapid transit. They have the uh, Norristown train. That does 70, uh, 75 miles an hour. And that's a mm. train that does all local stops. So. But wouldn't it be great if you, you pick up a train in Boston, say you're going to New York, and you get a train that goes 150 miles an hour. What would that take you? You you could, and you'd end up right in the city. That would be a faster trip than by plane. Yes, um, they found that out in Europe too. Because um, see, in this country, as meant to, as a myth as it is, like if you're going to California, naturally you take a, a plane. But the the um, you'll you say like um, Massachusetts, Connecticut. In New York, if you're over in Europe, you're going through three or four different countries. And they're roughly like uh, the same distance as Providence and Boston. So a train like that fast could get there faster than a plane because logically you can't take a plane from Providence to Logan. But if you take a plane from um, Logan to New York City, you have to get out to Logan, whether by rapid transit or by cab. You have to wait for the train, the plane to taxi out, get New York City or uh, Kennedy. Then you have to wait for a cab or a plane to take you back into the city again. That's right. Yeah, so a train would make more sense than a train going at that speed. I, I, I don't know. Do you, do you see the? Uh, you see that coming about? Um, I, they have to redo the track, straighten them out. Yeah, but I mean, does anybody have the, the ambition to do that? Is there anybody... Um, touting for that kind of a thing, or is that a lost cause? Well, it's contracted out already to uh, what they call ABB, which is a Swedish um, concern, and 
Bombardier, and they already make these. Um, they, they make these trains over in Europe. No, but aside from that, I, I and I, I I realize that you had mentioned that, but does anybody have the uh, the ambition? to back the, the remaking of the tracks and stuff so they can handle the speed of trains like that. Well, you know, Norm, I think there's a market for it because I went down to Philadelphia. No, no, I, I'm sure there is a market for it. I just wonder whether anybody's... I don't hear anybody say anything like that about, well, you know, we must institute well, fast rail travel and all that. I wonder if anybody really cares. Well, the government owns it. They, um, like in Europe, the government owns most of the railroad in... They're trying to keep people from using their automobiles, and it's so bad. Like when I, when you go down on a three-day weekend or a holiday, there are people standing, college kids actually laying on the floor. I mean, I never seen that in Europe. You have to step over, and you think you're in a college dormitory. Where's this? You're talking about this the... is a northeast, our northeast train going from between. Um, Boston and Point South to Washington. Okay, so so you're saying there is a market for this? Yes, especially. Okay, well I hope so. I, I I've got to move along, but I I, okay. ho I I hope that happens. Okay, Norm. I would love to see 150 mile an hour trains, you know, safe trains going from here to wherever. It would make it would make a whole lot of sense, I guess. I, I don't know how much financial sense it would make since I'm not the one financing it, but I hope that happens. Anyway, thanks a lot for the information, Don. Uh, John in uh, Pennsylvania. Hi, John. Hi, how you doing? Good. Thanks for hanging in there. I'm sorry uh, to keep you waiting so long. No problem. I uh, I just appreciate the show. I, well, I thank you. Clear weather tonight, and somehow I, I got a Boston station. Now, now where, where in Pennsylvania are you? Uh, Allentown. It's about okay. 50 miles uh, north of Philadelphia. Oh yeah, we get we get a fair amount of calls from people from that specific area really? of, of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania and Philadelphia both have Westinghouse stations. Uh -huh. They're very close to us on the dial, so people in those areas, we're, we're kind of blocked out by the local stations. But around Allentown, Harrisburg, right. uh, in that general area, we, we seem to do a little bit better. Yeah, I'm, I'm always on a constant quest for uh, old-time radio shows. Oh, really? You don't usually find them, but... Uh, no, we don't, we don't, we don't, we haven't done that here no. either. I do a talk on old-time radio. Yeah. Uh, with it, with with this is not on the air. But this is you know before before groups, and with excerpts of, uh, of those old shows and discussions, all that kind of stuff. What kind of old time radio do you like? Uh, well, you don't really find any, but um, yeah, do you collect I mean, do you collect the tapes at all? Because there's a lot of it on on cassettes now. I, I've listened to a few. That's my my major in the area right now. I'm I'm majoring in uh, radio, TV, and film. Oh really? Yeah. So I have a, a history of broadcasting class. And I've just been listening to a lot of AM radio. I have a an antique radio, and I, I've been trying to find some of those and just build up. Oh that. yeah, there's a New England antique radio club here. I imagine there may very well be up in your area. I would think. Yeah. No, no, I know there is one here, and they have they have auctions and sales and all going on where you can pick up old time radios, and they give you an idea of where you can pick up right. the tubes and everything to put them in shape. Yeah. Yours works pretty good. What kind of a radio is it? Um, it's an Emerson. It's, oh, I think yeah. it's from 1947, but it, it's got the new FM. It's not the old uh, 45 to 60, I think, is what the old FM was. Um, so it's mm. still, it's a vacuum tube radio. I found it at a, at a yard sale for about $10. Oh, yeah. And it, it, was it working when you got it? Yeah, yeah, it works. It's just missing two knobs, which are impossible to find. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. But, I uh, but more and more people seem to be interested in that stuff. I think it would maybe end up like, like old time cars. Yeah, where, I, I really you know think... where there are companies who who manufacture, you know, can duplicate the the equipment for old time cars, so that you can always get stuff to to fix it up. Right. I I really think there's a uh, a lot of people my age that would really be into it, especially listen to the radio. Uh, if you have an interesting show, kind of like yours or uh, Garrison Keeler, it keeps you awake on the highway. I mean. Oh, thank you. That's 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 nice. Uh, we do get a lot of calls from young people, particularly, oh, very often musicians who are on their way home from a gig or you yeah. know, to actors or whatever. And uh, old, there are some old-time radio shows that are really quite good and that do hold up very nicely, mostly the class acts like Jack Benny and Fred Allen right. and uh, 
some of the uh, some of the early Henry Morgan stuff. A lot of people are not aware of Henry Morgan, or if they are, they think of him as a guy sitting in on these panel shows as he did on television later. But that the, the early Henry Morgan was really off the wall and really nutty. I mean, he he'd make Saturday Night Live look like uh, I don't know the the Longines Symphonette, or I can't, I can't think of another comparable thing. But there was some some incredibly good, a lot of boring stuff too that that was not so great. Right. But I but uh, I play some some of the stuff in the uh, the thing that I do, and there's a there's some Fred Allen stuff that could have been written this morning, and you would you would find it hard to believe right. that that was broadcast like 50 and 60 years ago. Well, it's all timeless. We're we're still using cliches from then. So. Well, I mean, you know, this this was incredibly clever clever humor, and Benny, well, he was the same Benny. You know, he, he was in later years in television. A lot of those shows are really incredibly good uh they they amaze you they're so good because when you listen to them you expect you know well this is 50 60 years old how, right. how timely how, how can it it must sound really dated right and, it, and a lot of it really does not no. a lot of it does but a lot of it sounded bad even when it was new right uh one of the old tapes i got to listen to was uh burns and allen uh yeah, they 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 remain pretty much the same right up through uh, right up through the repeats that you see the reruns on television now. Right. Uh, Fibber McGee and Molly had some some funny moments. He he was the one with the closet, right? Yeah, he was the one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let, me, let, me, let me just check Molly. Let me get to that. No, don't open the closet, Fibber uh, McGee. <laughs> anyway, and the, the 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 fun thing was, you know, you're imagining what was pouring out of this closet. Right. Because they were on television for a little bit during the early days of television. They showed the closet, and it wasn't funny anymore. No, you know, you you then you didn't want to see it. You just wanted to hear it. You know, and and imagine yourself what was coming out. Right. Uh, that was you know one of the great things. I th I think just the idea that you could use your imagination and have the, the kind of your mind was the. It was the theater, you know, where where the where this movie played in your mind, you imagined it. It right. made it made it a great deal of fun. Yeah, and I think especially now, radio has seemed to uh, move over into uh, cars, especially in the morning with commutes. I think besides news, you'd you'd really have a lot of people paying attention because you don't. It's uh, not as visual, obviously, as TV, and you can imagine it. Uh, just that it can be in the background and it can be. You know. No, that that's true. A lot of things you you could imagine in a funnier way than you could ever depict it. There was one there's one skit too that that that, that Fred Allen is going in for a uh, to get a tuxedo, and uh, I, I won't even repeat the lines. But the thing is absolutely hilarious, and there's no way you can show a tuxedo and a guy being fitted that would be as funny as what you picture in your mind from just the words that the. Uh, that, that that you hear them say. Right. Anyway, that was that was the charm of the radio. I guess the the cliche is the theater of the mind and right. all of that kind of stuff. But basically, that's what it was. Do you ever get to play those shows on the air? Or I, do I, I I used uh, you know it's kind of funny back back when I was doing an all night jazz show back in the uh, way back in the late fifties. Uh, they, they were not releasing them on cassette. I don't think they even had tape in the late fifties. So maybe maybe it was just beginning. In any event, there was a guy who, who would send away for these on big discs, that which is the only way you could get these old radio shows. Right, right. And I was playing them on the air on part, as part of this jazz show, this all-night jazz show I was doing. And it got to be tremendously popular, so popular, that the management of that station made me stop playing it, uh, which is kind of funny. Because... <laughs> Because he thought if you know if nobody noticed at two o'clock in the morning I was playing this stuff, it was okay. But now people were noticing, and he was worried about the copyrights and and you know who owned the shows and oh, right. we'd get sued. So we had to stop doing it. So I did it. I did it back then. And in more recent years, there have been other people uh, now that now that they're much more accessible on tape and cassettes and all. More more of the guys have been playing it right. on occasion. You still don't hear an awful lot of it. And the sum of it that they play is not uh, not terribly funny, like the great Gildersleeve, and there are tons of others that older people remember with fond memories, but if you hear them, you have to say, that boy, that really wasn't funny. Right. Uh, Jack Benny was funny, Fred Allen, all these other things we're talking about. And uh, some of the mystery shows were kind of, were kind of interesting, too. Uh, some, some great writers, I'm telling you, and you're taking a whole course on this, but there was a writer named Arch Obler, 
Okay. So who, uh, the Fall uh, of the City, did he write? Yes, he did. He did He did one movie also. I don't remember ever seeing that, or if I did, I don't recall it. But he wrote radio drama. I thought was a genius. I thought he did some absolutely fantastic work. Right. That I guess would hold up today. That would, then they were tongue-in-cheek kind of shows like Vic and Sade and... And, of course, Bob and Ray, who originated here in Boston, I thought were one of the best exports we ever had from Boston. They were great. Mm -hmm. And so there was radio. Radio did some, some wonderful things, and I'm sorry that we're not doing such wonderful things anymore. It's, oh, but you, that the stupid birthday game. That, oh, well, thank you. I think that's very wonderful. <laughs> okay. I, just, I just think at this time of the day, maybe people are tired of, People screaming politics at each other, and maybe we ought to just giggle a little bit every exactly. now and then. People need to talk more. What do you, What do you plan to do uh, with with, uh, with with this communications course and all the, the uh, stuff that you're doing? Well, <laughs> I don't know. That's the the cool thing about it is you can do just about anything. So I I like shooting video. I like editing. Um, I also like audio because I'm I'm a musician as well. So I think it leaves a lot of opportunities open and I just like to do whatever keeps me happy. So I, I wish you a great deal of luck, John. I, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I hope we can talk again soon. I hope I can still pick you up later. <laughs> I, I hope so too. Take right. care of yourself. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Time for us to say goodbye uh, on behalf of uh, Michael Cannon and uh, Tom Howie and uh, Tony Nesbitt, the lovely Marilyn Gorelick, myself, the exciting and I'd uh, be excited. Why don't I say that? The almost good-looking Norm Nathan person has some interesting people I'd like you to hear tonight. So if you can join us, we'll be talking about uh, some of the Disney works that never got aired or never got uh, featured at all and a uh, whole bunch of stuff like that, okay? Very happy St. Patrick's Day. I hope it's a good day for you. Bye-bye, old sport from WBZ Boston. That concludes our March 17th broadcast. We now cut to March 18th. Jeekers, but it's really swell to be with you. We'll be here just a couple hours, but hey, we'll make the most of each uh, each moment. And a couple of interesting people. One is a man named Steve Daly, who uh, writes for Entertainment Weekly and is the author of a real fun book called Toy Story, The Art and Making of the Animated Film, and will take us behind the scenes and give us the inside story on the production of this uh, history-making motion picture, Toy Story. Uh, and also we'll be talking later on with uh, Charles Solomon, uh, who's uh, an animation historian. That, that's got to be a very specialized field, isn't it? There aren't too many people involved there. Uh, an animation historian uh, who has written a book called The Disney That Never Was. So we're going to do, do a lot of talking about Walt Disney. And we'll, we'll get to both these guys in just a minute. I won't brought in uh, some of the greatest names in jazz for uh, an awful lot of years. And we'll talk with Lenny in just a minute, and then we'll talk about Disney right after that. And if this doesn't seem like an action-packed program, I don't know what. I don't know how we're going to get all this swell stuff in, in a mere two hours. But we'll do the best we can, kids. Hello. Hey, Norm. Hey, hey, Lenny. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Hey, it's, good, just... it's good to hear your voice. To... Uh, the uh, I remember the first time I heard it uh, uh, many at, years ago. Met, many years ago, you would be <laughs> selling uh, roast beef sandwiches and stuff, and well, as well as not on a street corner, though. No, not on a street corner. No, at Lenny's on the Turnpike on Route One in Peabody, in the northbound lane. As well, not yeah. really in the, directly in the northbound lane, but right off of that. That's right. And uh, and bringing in some of the really great performers, but and a lot of people say, whatever happened to Lenny's? I say. I say he married Michelle Pfeiffer and is selling Indian artifacts in a arts and crafts store off of, off of Tierra del Fuego or something like that. <laughs> I'd have to work my way through Robert Redford to, to do that. Huh? Yeah. Anyway. Have seen uh, so many commercials in a movie? Is Robert Redford and Michelle Pfeiffer lately? Uh, no, I know they've really been promoting that quite a good deal. Yeah. And I know that uh, in, in between, uh, since uh, Lenny's closed, 
Which was when? Was that was that back 1972. in 1972? Has it been that long? September 72, 24 years ago. This coming September. Isn't isn't that amazing, boy? I are we know. are we getting to be old and decrepit? I know it, and I and I hit, sit here talking to you on the telephone, and I remember how many times I drove down Marcy Boulevard at one o'clock in the morning, plus with an artist and hanging out with you and Dick. <laughs> I know it that with uh, the Dick old w -H -D -A -W -H. Yeah, that's right. That's right with Dick Erickson. Yeah. Uh, with the the old sounds on the night. It's amazing how many people remember not only you uh, and and the Lenny's on the Turnpike. Uh, uh, it also remember the the old all night show, which has been off the air since oh, yeah. uh, since sixty sixty eight or something like that. I know, that. but n we'll never forget that sounds tonight because. For one reason, uh, I'm calling tonight is because we associate that show with with the Count Basie Orchestra because you used to open and close with it. That's right, uh, Midnight Blue. Midnight my theme Blue song. and Little Darlin. Little, little. Well, Little Darlin was the Speed Anderson. He used the uh, Count Basie also as his theme. Yeah. And he was on another station. Uh -huh. uh, I for, forget which station, but but the Speed is a is a good guy. And he used Little Darlin, and I used uh, Midnight Blue. There anyway, you, you you've been I had the right station. You've been you've been promoting uh, you've been promoting jazz, even though you haven't had the club since that period of time. And you have something coming up. Yeah, I have been involved from time to time, Norman. For a dance, I never would have believed that would have ever happened a few years ago. It shows you anything can happen. It Norman. shows you that uh, you Jewish guys are really getting hip. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm going to get uh, some nasty mail about that. Of course, my association with Basie goes uh, back a few years, as you well know. I know it does, and. Uh, uh, your, your association with just about everybody in jazz goes yeah, back a few years. Uh, and I, we were talking on the, on the phone a little earlier today, and you were mentioning all the performers, who, people who sang with Basie, for example. Incredible, huh? Eight, no, let's see, three, six different vocalists that were featured with the Basie band from the inception of the band in 1935, when it came out of, uh, when it began in Kansas City. Jimmy Rushing. And Joe Williams, of course, was a band in the '50s. Bill Henderson sang with the band in uh, in the '60s, and of course, touring uh, with the band Jimmy Witherspoon and Arthur Prysock. and of course, O.C. Smith in the '60s uh, made his debut with the uh, Count Basie band. And these are people who they all performed all at your club. All featured at the club, right? Yeah, yeah. Good taste, huh, Norm? No, you 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 had great taste. I really missed I missed the club at, at, at a good deal. And, I know, uh, and you used to be in there too. I I caught you there many. In fact, oh. I have a bar bill for you. <laughs> That's about time I paid up. I'll catch up with you. Uh, you know, I, I've often said that we never really appreciated. Well, you you because you oh, you had to work hard because you picked up the musicians. They would open on what like a Monday night and play for an entire week, which is Monday through Sunday yeah. with a matinee yeah. on Sunday. Listen, I read the book and I thought Simon Legree was the hero. You know, <laughs> no. no, the the fact is that there there are no clubs like that now. I mean, there are jazz clubs, <laughs> no, but, but none true. none where they play seven seven nights a week. No, uh, I, I, well, I, and they I, were glad to get the work though, Norm. Yeah, and I and I lived you know I lived right around the corner from where 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 your club was. That's right, and. Uh, I appreciated you being there, but I should have appreciated it more. Well, I appreciated Sandy's being there, and I missed the heck out of Sandy's. You no, know, they, they just I tore was over in Beverly. They just tore the building down. I know, I know. That's that's really sad. I, I Sandy would have been so unhappy at that. Well, our building is still uh, was was burnt down. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I I. I, I I want to, one, one night soon, we have to do a full-fledged interview because I want to talk with you about your years uh, from from the time when uh, Lenny's on the Turnpike was known as the place with the, the hippest uh, jukebox in the world. The Turnpike Club. Yeah, the Turnpike Club, that's right. And and when you started booking live talent mm -hmm. and all that and, and how you went on then to, uh, to internationally known big jazz people and all of that. Time but, for a review, huh, Norm? Yeah, we, we're going to have to. We'll have to do that within the next few weeks, if that's okay with you, because I'd love oh, to do I'd that. I'd love to do that. I, you know, I was sitting in in uh, the Charles Hotel at the Regatta Bar last night, and uh, a young man came over to the table. It never fails when I go into Scholars or or the Regatta Bar that somebody doesn't come up to the to my table and say, "Hey, gee, I used to take my girl to your club, or I used to come to the matinees with my dad." Uh, thank you very much. Get out of here. <laughs> No, that's that's uh, got to be a great. It's got to be a great thrill. 
Now, it's got to be a great thrill uh, for you to, because uh, every anybody who likes jazz at all, rem unless they're under the age of two months or something, you know, remembers right. we Lenny. We should do that some night. I want to make make sure that your listeners out there, I know, and know, I know they are, their age bracket is into Count Basie. Uh, anybody who loves blues and loves the ensemble uh, big band sound certainly remembers the Basie band, and that legacy is continuing, Norm. You know. Uh, even mm -hmm. though uh, uh, Bill Basie passed away a few years ago, guys like Eric Dixon and Thad Jones and Frank Foster have led the band, and now currently Grover Mitchell will be leading the band into uh, Temple Emmanuel. Okay. I hope they've all been Bob Mitzvahs. <laughs> mention, mention again the night this is going it's to be in the It's going to take place. place a week from tonight, Norman, okay. uh, March 24th. And can I tell people where they can get tickets? You certainly can. Uh, tickets are available at the Temple, which is on uh, Atlantic Avenue in uh, Marblehead, or at Photographics, a very fine video shop at uh, Benin Square in Marblehead, Arnold's Art Gallery at, uh, in, in the Old Town of Marblehead. And you know Gene Arnold does a great jazz series himself during the summer. Mm. And uh, either Sunglass Hut at Liberty Tree Mall or, or the North Shore Mall. Excellent. Okay, a week from that's a week from tonight. Uh, Temple Emanuel, which is on what's what what street is that? Atlantic on? Avenue. Atlantic Avenue, because one of the main roads through Marblehead. Right, and in Marblehead, a quiet little Jewish fishing village, <laughs> north south of Swamps, north of Swamps, south of Swamps. It's uh, north of Swamps. Got it. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. I'm turned around here. <laughs> okay. You're looking at but it from the Salem viewpoint. If they want to write a telephone number down, Norm, uh, I'll give them this number, 508-745-1140. Uh, if they want ticket information. Okay, 508 is the area code, and then 745-1140. Right. And uh, you'll get information. And it's going to be a great night. It's going to be a, a, a great sound on the North Shore, and people will be able to dance and have refreshments at an old-fashioned concert and dance. That's right, and when and when you can hear the Count Basie band, oh, yeah. uh, by all means, don't miss it when it's so one close to us. One o'clock, jumping, jumping at the Woodside, all the oldies plus a few of the new ones. Great, excellent, excellent, Lenny. And we'll be in touch because I, I I do want to talk in great detail some night about all the people that you've met and all the people that you've know, performed. Well, I'd love perform. that, Norm, you know. I would like that very much also, Lenny, and good luck. You hope a lot of people Always get to. Always a pleasure talking to you, baby. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Take care of yourself. Have a good night. You too, Lynn. Bye-bye now. Is the uh, staff writer for Entertainment Weekly, author of Toy Story, the art uh, and making of uh, the animated film. And uh, it's a fascinating book, and I'm delighted that uh, you're, you're on the air with us, Steve. Thank you very much. And oh, thank, you, thank you for hanging in there, too. I appreciate that. Sure thing. Well, uh, any, any jazz plug is of interest to me. Are you, are you a jazz fan? Uh, I should be much more educated about it, but I'm uh, rather uneducated, but I am a fan. No, if you're a fan, that's okay, because the education comes, uh, comes along as long as the interest is there. I appreciate that, because I used to do a jazz show a few years back, and huh. it's still the kind of music that I love a great deal. Uh, you know, a fellow here at Entertainment Weekly whose name is David Haydu, who is a general editor here, has written a book about uh, Billy Strayhorn. Oh really? Out a couple of months. Yeah, really terrific piece of work. Oh, the uh, the great uh, Duke Ellington uh, uh, side man and, and composer. Not only just side man, but Correct. composer. Yeah, he. As a matter of fact, he wrote a lot of things that uh, people think Duke Ellington wrote because they wrote, sort of wrote the, the, a similar in a similar vein. Uh, some some magnificent stuff. What, now, what is the book called? It's called Lush Life. Oh, Lush and, uh, Life. I'm sure my editor would be thrilled. I'm here on the air giving him a plug. <laughs> oh, oh, because it's uh, coming out in a couple of months. Okay, Lush Life by Billy Strayhorn. i got to dig that up. Oh, the author's name is David Haydu, but it's a, it's a biography of Billy Strayhorn. Okay, now, how do you spell Haydu? H-A-J-D-U. I, I don't know if it's Czechoslovakian or it's... He's of some Eastern heritage. Okay. Okay, we'll have to look at it because Billy uh, Lush Life was one of the great jazz classics. Uh, there were a whole series of drinking kind of songs about people who took to drink because they had had un unhappy uh, uh, love lives. Well, and Strayhorn was a terrible alcoholic. In fact, he, uh, he I, I believe he like lost his stomach late in life. He literally was on some sort of, you know, almost ghastly uh, 
sort of intestinal hookup where he, uh, you know, it, it ruined him. The alcohol. Oh, I, I, I never, I never realized that. I thought, I thought Lux Life. Well, I, obviously that was about drinking, but I, I, I thought the emphasis there was more on some poor soul who had lost his love. Oh yes, I mean I was, I was making the leap to uh, what happened to him later in life. He always yeah. was a fan of alcohol, and it, it caught up with him after a while. Okay, hi. That's a complicated story. Hey, Jew. Hey, hey, Jew. Hey, it's pronounced Hey, Do, even though hey, there's do, a J. Hey, do. Okay, we, we, the, the J is silent. Hey, Do. Lush Life, the uh, story of uh, Billy Strayhorn. Well, I'll, I will dig that up, and uh, maybe we can, we can even get in touch with Hey Do and talk about that on the air one one future night. I'm sure he'd be happy to. Anyway, your book is fascinating. You have a kind of a three, uh, not a kind of a, but a 3D cover on it. A big, big book with some great, uh, great illustrations and all. And the uh, the story of uh, the Toy Story, uh, not only the finished product, you have a lot of pictures of that, but uh, the sketches from the storyboard and stuff as that was leading up to it. And uh, the first the the first animated film of its kind, isn't it? The first computer uh, animated full-length motion picture. That's right. It's the first full-length uh, animated film made entirely on computers. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when uh, Snow White came out, which was the first... Was that the first full-length animated film? Well, uh, Charles Solomon actually could probably tell you exactly what the competing titles were. Uh, there There were one or two other feature-length films, but they weren't American, and they, they really had, I think one was a, what they call a silhouette film, possibly made by someone, uh, a, a, either a German or a, I don't know if it was German, Czech, or Russian, but there was someone who had attempted one that was, um, it wasn't of the level of endeavor that Walt, well, that Snow White was, but for all intents and purposes, Snow White was the first commercial American animated feature. It was certainly the first musical full-length animated anim uh, feature that I know of. And the first one that, that was done as well as it was done, I, I remember uh, a man named Max Fleischman was putting out some... Fleischer, his name was. Oh, Fleischer, not that's Fleischman. Right. Fleischer, that's right, too. He had he had a film out, but none of them... Uh, uh, there was there, there's a was a flair to the Disney films that was different than, than any other animated film at all. And uh, you kind of would expect that the Disney people would come out with the first computer uh, animated the full-length motion picture toy story which was was that was that a risky kind of thing it turned out well and uh, has done i guess it's done well i hear all kinds of great co things about it well but, again you know norm I'm a, I'm a little prejudiced because i spent a lot of time with the uh, dozens and dozens of artists i mean i think there's a staff of about 110 uh, who actually put this film together and i was lucky enough to spend a good chunk of time with them as we were putting the book together not as much as as everyone might have uh, liked, but uh, enough to to get all the flavor into the book. Um, in fact, the movie is a collaboration between the Walt Disney Studios, who produced it, put up the money for it, and supervised the development of it. But it is, in fact, the actual work of a small little studio called Pixar Productions that is hundreds of miles away from uh, Los Angeles, up outside of San Francisco in the East Bay. And the company, uh, the creative director of the film end of the company, the filmmaking end of the company, is a fellow named John Lasseter, who in fact had been an animator at the Disney Studios back in the early 80s. And he saw a movie called Tron back in the early 80s that he wasn't working on, but he saw some of the computer effects and he was so impressed by it that he decided that he wanted to work in that medium. Uh, and at the time... This was before Michael Eisner had taken over the management of the Walt Disney Company, and the company was sort of in a probably the lowest creative state it had ever been in. And they weren't interested in; they really weren't interested in. They could they could barely turn out a conventional animated film, let alone jumping into this other uh, realm. So the Walt Disney Company did sort of take a chance. They financed this film with a uh, to be made by a small company that had never made a film longer than three or four minutes, and none of them have ever, had ever had any dialogue. Mm. Uh, John Lasseter's films, he, he won a, uh, an Academy Award for a short called Tin Toy. Back, I, I'm not sure if it was 88 or 89. And the studio, the Pixar studio, has won a number of technical awards for improvements they've made to 
camera techniques for regular animation where you draw with a pencil and then uh, you transfer it into a digital ink and paint environment. That, that digital system for coloring in the drawings is something that Pixar created with the Walt Disney Company. But yeah, no, it was, it was kind of like Snow White. I mean, you spoke about it before. Nobody knew, you know, will people sit still for an hour and a half of something that no human hand uh, has actually touched? You know, is, uh, they didn't want to make it a gimmick. Uh, they, they wanted to have a good, strong story. And they spent a heck of a long time uh, doing it. Yeah, because you, you mentioned that uh, they did want a, a story and they wanted uh, uh, people to identify you know, in a human kind of way with these characters and all of that, so so that would that so the people wouldn't feel feel they were sitting there watching some kind of a gimmicky thing. I just wondered, was there any one individual who said, "Yeah, let's go ahead with that"? That would be that that had to be an awfully brave choice to make. Uh, well, you have to look at this as it wasn't the only type of that decision that Disney made at the time. This was in the early. Well, I guess actually this started a little before 1991. Uh, Disney was having a tremendous success putting all their old films out on home video. And they could see, even back in 89 and 90, that within five or six years, uh, they were going to be through that catalog. They would have released every one of their vintage movies and made a pile of money on home video. And... Uh, if they wanted to have product in the pipeline uh, to release to theaters and on video, and also to have fresh characters that uh, could tie into the theme parks and merchandising and all the other divisions of the company that depend on the movies first and foremost, they were going to have to turn to outside producers because in, in decades and decades of trying, they'd still never been able to make more than one animated film every two years. They were barely keeping to that schedule. Uh, and so in the early 90s, uh, with Michael Eisner's approval, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who of course is no longer at the Walt Disney Company, uh, but he supervises a traditional feature animation branch that is now very ably headed by a fellow named uh, Peter Schneider oh. and another fellow named Tom Sch uh, Schumacher. Uh, who always ran the division, even when Katzenberg was supervising the entire output of the Walt Disney Studios. Um, they decided to turn to some outside producers to produce other kinds of animated films to supplement their traditional animated features like The Lion King and Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin. Um, and that was when they made a decision to turn to Pixar, uh, based mostly on the strength of the computer animation scene that was done for Beauty and the Beast, the ballroom scene, which every audience that sees that picture at some point or another winds up talking about how wonderful that scene was. Yes. And uh, another thing that happened that same year was that Terminator 2 came out, the James Cameron movie. And in that movie was a robot character who had been produced primarily with computer animation. And the movie was such an enormous hit and made such an impression on people that uh, the moment seemed right to take a chance on building an entire movie around computer-generated characters. And that's why the Walt Disney Company, which had been flirting with Pixar, uh, they, in fact, they had tried to hire John Lasseter away. Uh, they said, you know, why don't you come down? You can direct for us. And he said, no, I like the company I'm at. I like the work I'm doing. And I want to work in computer animation. I don't want to go back to traditional animation. And he stuck to his guns, and they finally came to Pixar and said, we will make an agreement with, with you to finance the films and we'll control the merchandising and the release, uh, but you will actually produce the film. And that's what happened. What, what were the uh, major problems that they went through uh, while making this, this uh, film? At, at first, you, you, were, you were saying, uh, you, you had written in the book, that there are kind of a lot of individual scenes that maybe weren't tied together enough or there wasn't a proper flow or... Uh, every, everything they did, though, everything that was done for this film was done, like, for the very first time. And I wondered uh, what kind of problems you face when the, there are no guidelines, really. You're making your own. Well, you know, we started work on the book last, uh, a little over a year ago. And uh, at the time, it was just about the time when everyone at the studio was finally, it was finally sinking into them that this movie was really going to work. Uh, they had just beginning... They were just beginning to see finished footage. 
because computer animation is done in a sort of hierarchical series of steps where the first thing you see when you're working as an animator are these incredibly rough sort of abstracted versions of the characters you're working on. Hmm. So you're, you know, you got executives looking month after month at these stick figures and it's very difficult to imagine what the finished product is going to look like. In fact, if you look at the book and see what those early, what they call polygonals, you know, they're made out of polygons, you look at it and you think, this is, you know, what the heck, this is, looks like a child drew it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's very hard to imagine the finished project, uh, product. And that was a tremendous pressure on these people all through the process. It's hard enough to make any kind of an animated feature work uh, because you so much depends on the voice actors, on the gestures, on uh, uh, weaving a good story together. Weaving a good story together is, is very difficult in any medium. But in this medium, where you really don't know how much the visuals are going to affect what your story is, it was doubly difficult. Um, and I think because they were under so much pressure and so much scrutiny, they had a harder, even harder time of it than some of the Disney traditional features have had. There's always a point where the story can get difficult. I mean, on Beauty and the Beast and on Aladdin, there were, there were points in the development of those films where literally almost everything that a team had spent one or two years making was thrown out. Mm. Uh, at one point, Jeffrey Katzenberg sat down and looked at Aladdin I think about a year before it was actually completed and said, this is junk. <laughs> Nothing's working. The main character is uninteresting. He's absent. He's not even in his own movie. Uh, we've got a mother character who's uninteresting. We've got a genie who's terrific but doesn't show up till halfway through the picture. And he basically threw out half the movie. Uh, the same thing happened with Lion King, uh, which was put through some 11 or 12 previews. Uh, while they, they really fine-tuned and basically rewrote the ending three or four times. And the same thing happened to Toy Story. Uh, after about a year of story development, they were just about to begin final animation, you know, or to begin the animation process of the entire film, which first is done just on sketches, on little sheets of paper that look like index cards, like if you were writing a term paper back in college. They stick those up on bulletin boards, and then they photograph those as little still frames, and they run a, a dummy soundtrack to it in order to see, well, here's roughly what the finished movie is going to be like. And they try and work out as much as they can before they actually animate it, because it's incredibly time-consuming and expensive to throw away any finished animation. The goal is don't ever animate anything until you're certain it's going to work and it's going to be in the movie. Well, when they put together their first version of what they call those story reels, it was a disaster. Uh, Tom Hanks had already been hired as the voice of Woody, this little ragdoll cowboy that this little boy has who is very jealous of another toy called Buzz, who's a spaceman, uh, who's voiced by Tim Allen. And in the early versions of these stories, Woody, the idea was that Woody was a character who was going to find uh, redemption. He was a very jealous, immature kind of guy who tries to get rid of a competitor and winds up having to work with this guy, you know, in the classic tradition of a buddy picture. And, uh, and he's reformed. He turns out to be a helpful guy by the end of the film. Well, the theory they tried was, well, if he's going to turn into a nice guy, let's start out by having him be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and the character was such a jerk that on, in November of 1993, John Lasseter and a number of the producers, uh, Ralph Guggenheim, Bonnie Arnold, uh, and a number of other key creative people went down to the Disney studios and sat down with uh, Tom Schumacher, Peter Schneider, Jeffrey Katzenberg, I believe Michael Eichner may also have been one of the people to look at it. And John Lasseter, who's, uh, by the way, the co-author of the book, uh, he recounted to me sinking down into his seat lower and lower and lower as this first story reel was unspooled for these executives who were putting up close to $30 million dollars make this movie and he said steve it was terrible uh, i we were the first people to, to agree this is just a disaster <laughs> we have a main character that you don't even want to see for five minutes let alone an hour and a half oh dear and disney said this is so bad that we're shutting down production until you rework the script uh and you've got three months 
I, it wasn't quite presented as an ultimatum, but the deal was, you know, there's only so many costs we can keep floating. And uh, there was a lot of tussling back and forth. Look, you know, if you, if you shut down production now, we're going to lose all these animators. Computer graphics is a very hot field. We're going to lose talented people. And the Disney execs had to say, look, we know that that's a problem, but if you don't have a story to animate, you can't animate. Oh. So for three months, every day of the week, they worked and worked and worked. They worked over Christmas. They worked over New Year's. And by mid-February, they had pretty much junked the entire first third of their original draft and completely changed around the opening scene, deleted a couple of supporting characters, uh, re-recorded all the dialogue, <laughs> Hmm. giving Tom Hanks completely different line readings and in many cases completely different dialogue. And it wasn't quite fixed by February of 94, but it was close enough that the studio said, okay, we can see that this is going to work now. And hmm. uh, even, that's what happened. Now, even, at, even at that point, uh, to say, yeah, it's, it's, re it's, it is, it's, it's, it's been reworked and it's going to... It, it, things seem to be working out okay now. T to say that is something, too, because you're talking about a product that has never been done before on that scale. I'm, I know you mentioned that, you know, these computer animations have been done three or four minute this, things, commercials, that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, and it's, it's unknown ter territory in every way. Here's an action movie. Okay, it's a comedy and an action movie. It's a buddy movie. That's never been done as a cartoon. Uh, another huge creative risk. This is not really a musical. And this was a major tussle between Pixar and the Walt Disney Company. The Pixar folks did not want to make a musical. Uh, you know, a form that Disney has had tremendous success with. And the creative solution that was come up with was that the movie would have uh, songs that, were called, that are called song over action where the music sort of comments on what's going on, but is not actually sung by a character in the film. Nobody knew if that was going to work. Uh, and in fact, many people at Pixar were like, you know, why do we have to stop the movie dead in its tracks? You know, we're not trying to make a musical. We want to make a buddy movie in cartoon form. And what they kept arguing was, you don't understand, this stuff looks so photorealistic that the audience is going to accept it as an action movie. And... Again, um, it's, very, it's always difficult to have hindsight before you put the thing together. A lot, I think there was a lot of worry that, uh, you know, if this doesn't come off looking the way we hope, this better darn well have some music because that's been so important in getting a general audience to relate to an animated film. So it was a very, you know, I, I think that people on both sides very passionately, Disney was adamant that it be a musical and some of the key creative people were adamant that it not be and i think they worked out a much better compromise than i think either side thought was going to happen when they started and yeah, what certainly and that you know they're up for academy awards for best score and best song i, I don't think anybody thought that was going to happen when they got that started. Got a while let me just take a lot and uh, steve is the uh, co-author of a book on the uh, on the walt disney film Toy Story, the art and making of the animated film, and of course the first ever computer animated full-length motion picture, and I always admire anybody who's ever connected with the first ever anything. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, they're, they're, they're going into the whole world of the unknown, and it's and it, and it is so nice, it's turned out well for them. Uh, oh, it's, it's turned out more than well. Uh, it's kind of staggering, I think. Uh, this film will... It, I think it's at about 185 million domestic U.S. box office at this point. Uh, I'm not certain whether there's a reissue coming after the Academy Awards. Uh, the film will win a special technical award for John Lasseter that's already been announced that he'll get on Oscar night. And they're up for three Academy Awards, uh, including Best Original Screenplay, um, which I agree is a, is a much-deserved nomination. Um, and they actually have some, they might have a shot at that uh, because it's adapted screenplay that um, probably will be won by Emma Thompson. Um, I don't think in their wildest dreams Pixar realized it would, yeah, they, they thought they had a success. But um, 
I think they thought maybe they'd top out at about a hundred million and they've done, um, you know, a good 60 million. Well, when the final tally is counted, they'll probably do a good $60 million more business oh. than Pocahontas did. And that is a source of immense satisfaction to the people at Pixar, uh, because, uh, they were the little engine that could. That's, that's true. As, as, uh, as you mentioned earlier, and I just mentioned this for people who may not have heard the, the beginning of all this, uh, Steve Daly was mentioning that Pixar is a, uh, a film company that's north, a good deal north of Los Angeles, up in the, what, the San Francisco area you mentioned, who have made these kind of computer animated uh, films, but short ones, mostly commercials, I guess, and little uh, short three, that's four right. minute things. This is the first time they've been involved in a, in a whole full length thing, and uh, you were talking about uh, stopping production at one point because it didn't look like it was going well, according to the uh, authorities at uh, Disney and all that. And suddenly they've they've come out with this incredible success uh, in an area of uh, in an unknown area, doing something that nobody has ever done before of, of this length. How, how does this affect Pixar in the future? Uh, will they be doing more of these these kind of films? Uh, uh, they they still can't be a small little animated uh, computer animated film company up in San Francisco. <laughs> Well, believe it or not, they are. One, one of the revolutionary things about this movie that I think scares the bejesus out of traditional animators, although there's a lot of talk and noise about, oh, no, traditional animation will coexist with uh, computers, which is true. I mean, traditional animation has been so enormously, enormously successful for the Walt Disney Company. It's not going away. But this movie took almost four years to make, and it involved only 110 people. Disney's traditional animated features take almost that long. They take between three and four years each, but they involve 700 people. Mm. And it doesn't take a mathematical genius or a computer scientist to figure out that that's a lot bigger payroll. Uh, mm. Toy Story really only it came in, I think, under $30 million when these big super productions like Pocahontas, uh, the the final tallies I was reading was that that neighborhood, that movie was in the neighborhood of $50 million just to produce and not to market. Um, it, you know, when a movie can cost almost half and makes as much or more, you're going to keep working on in that vein. <laughs> and that's exactly what they've done. Uh, Disney was shrewd enough to pretty much, you know, insist with Pixar that they enter into a three-picture contract, which the Walt Disney Company had the right to break at any point, I believe, or break in the sense of if Pixar didn't come up with another idea that Disney approved, Disney had the right to say, no, this idea isn't good enough, and we will, or, you know, basically they, they were covered. They, were, they had a way out of the contract, uh, but with the movie such an enor enormous success, everyone's very keen to continue it, especially Disney. Uh, because they're financially in a pretty good position about this, and they're already deep in production on the second computer animated feature, which they, I think they will, well, I don't think I know, that there's no other company that's going to get a computer animated feature out before them. So they not only have produced the first, they almost certainly will produce the second ever computer yeah. animated feature. It's called Bugs, mm -hmm. and it's essentially uh, a take on the grasshopper and the ant. It's about a little group of ants in a backyard who are beset uh, uh, by uh, grasshoppers who keep stealing their food and their provisions, and they hire a troop of fierce bugs to protect them, kind of, well, not even kind of, very much like the Magnificent Seven and the Seven Samurai. That's sort of the idea that it's taken off from. And that is due... Thanksgiving of 98, if everything continues to go on track, uh, which is never guaranteed in animation. No, but I would, I would imagine that uh, people are going to be a little more reluctant to object to things in this film. Don't you well, think that, that is the hope. The people at Pixar are hoping, you know, we've, we've gone the distance. We've taken every punch you could throw at us. And again, the Pixar people are the first to say, if it were not for the story development expertise of some people at Disney, this movie wouldn't be nearly as good as it was. I mean, as a number of the story people pointed out to me, you know, 
that lousy first version that we threw up on reels in November 93, if this were any other company but the Walt Disney Company, that picture would have gotten made exactly as it was, and it would have been lousy. Mm. The Walt Disney Company, you know, has the money, and more importantly, it has the leadership uh, to recognize that it is worth spending two years to develop a good story, um, and that it's worth spending that money because in the long run you get something so much better. And they're willing to retool the picture. They're willing to throw out parts of it that don't work. Those are difficult and expensive decisions. And it takes not just, it isn't just a fiscal uh, uh, talent. It takes genuine creative talent to do that. And this is something that, you know, Walt Disney had when he was still alive and that he has managed to inculcate into other people. And I, I, I don't mean to be a booster for them, but I, I genuinely feel that there is a devotion to quality there that is not, uh, that is very hard to achieve. We're going to be talking uh, during the next hour with Charles Solomon, who has written a book called The Disney That Never Was. This kind of Disney night. Your story about the Toy Story, your, your book, is a beautiful book and so much fun to read, Steve Daly. I really appreciate you coming on with us. It's it's a Hyperion, well Hyperion Publishers in New York has published the book, and uh, it's it's a uh, it's beautiful to look at, and it's uh, a great deal of fun to read and and very exciting. Uh, get about the the very first computer animated full length motion picture. You told the story well, and you've got some great pictures in that. I would I would guess that kind of a book is should be available most anywhere for people who want to pick it up. Just look for that big 3D cover in any uh, any chain bookstore. Or better yet, go to your local bookseller and give them the business. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. And, and the book written by uh, Steve Daly, along with, uh, uh, I forget his first John name. Lassiter. John Lasseter. John Lasseter. You'll hey. see him on the Academy Awards on March 25th. There okay. he'll be. We'll be looking for him. a statuette. <laughs> okay. Hey, thanks a million, Steve. You're a fascinating man, and the book is great, and I really appreciate you coming on. Sure thing. It's a pleasure. Take care. Bye. Okay. Well, I've often wondered about the about the uh, the fact that Walt Disney has been so successful through the years. The Disney Studios have with uh, their animated productions and now their computer animated uh, production of the toy uh, story. Toy story. Uh, why why are there not you think other animated uh, features by other studios? Nobody really has ever tried to. Not not directly copy Walt Disney, but nobody has done quite the kind of things that he has done. Well, I think a lot of the problem has been that people have tried to copy Disney instead of trying to copy his spirit, which was always to do something new and original. There have been a lot of animated features, especially in recent years, but very few of them have been very good. And you look at a number of them and you can see, okay, they're trying to do uh, Be Our Guest from... Beauty and the Beast here. They're trying to do um, this effect from another Disney film there. Instead of just sitting down and working out a story that needs animation to tell it. Uh, now, now, for example, I, I've not seen other animated, full-length animated films. Maybe I've missed them, but I haven't seen them outside of the Disney studios. Um, there have been some, and you haven't missed much, frankly. Quite a few of them have come and gone very, very quickly. Um, in fact, several times over the last couple decades, up until this new sort of golden age, as people sometimes talk about it, there were periodic critical articles that would appear saying the animated feature was dead, that this last spate of films did so poorly, that uh, you know the medium isn't valid anymore, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, at the same time, they were also always predicting, well, we're going to have a renaissance soon, and there are these new people coming up. So you had a medium that was simultaneously dying and undergoing a renaissance. Made for a very strange um, situation for a number of years. Now, we, we, I, had, I had the off-the-air woman had called. She was an animator, she said. Mm -hmm. And she, she was a little concerned because she felt maybe the, uh, the computer animation like in the in toy story which was so successful and which is obviously cheaper than a totally animated film that is with animators and and, and artists and so on uh that that might replace animation as we know it you think it will or, or will they both work no. hand in hand um 
Not at all. In the first place, I don't know that doing a film in computer animation is any cheaper than doing it um, in hand-drawn, particularly not a film of the quality of Toy Story. But I don't see computer animation replacing hand-drawn animation any more than photography replaced painting. You know, they're two different media, and they have different strengths and different weaknesses. Um, what I think is the most exciting thing to come along with that technology is the use of uh, combining computer graphics and hand-drawn animation to create something that otherwise you'd never be able to put on the screen. And an example of that is the wildebeest stampede in uh, The Lion King, where you started out with one hand-animated wildebeest, and they were able to turn it into that enormous uh, herd stampeding over the cliff. Um, no one could have ever drawn that by hand, obviously. And if you had tried to do it purely in computer, it probably would have been stiffer and less convincing um, instead of having that believable kind of animal motion that it had. So um, another example would be the ballroom sequence in Beauty and the Beast, where suddenly you're swept into this kind of uh, magical world that's different from the rest of the film. Um, this is what excites me as someone who has to look at and write about animation often, this, uh, the possibility of just creating new visuals and giving the artists more tools to give us things that we haven't seen before. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, the uh, Disney Studios also combining live action and animation. I guess that hasn't been done in too many Disney films, but the uh, Uncle Remus stories... Yes, uh, the Song of the South. Yes. And also in uh, some of the wartime films, uh, the ones about South America where Donald would dance with the, uh, the South American uh, women singing and dancing to uh, uh, some of the songs from that area. Oh, yeah, I was thinking of Gene Kelly now that, that you mentioned that. Gene's yeah, Anchors Away. Anchors yeah. Away has that memorable scene. Yeah, Tom and Jerry dancing with uh, Gene Kelly, which was animated by... Uh, Anna and Barbera before they went on to become, uh, you know, do all the Saturday morning stuff. Yeah, I just, I just had talked to, just to, in the first hour of the program uh, with uh, Steve Daly, who has, uh, has written a book called uh, uh, Toy Story, the Art and Making of the Animated Film. And he did uh -huh. say that, uh, that this computer animation did cost uh, a good deal less or employed a, f a lot less people uh, then straight animation would cost. That's why I mentioned that uh, that I thought the uh, computer animated stuff was was uh, quite not quite as expensive as as uh, animation. And and went wondering whether if that were true, would would that cut down on the animation and all go to computer animation? I guess you pretty much answered that anyway, saying that's you you don't believe that's true. No, um, at this point, and you, I think you can see it even by. Um looking at Toy Story, there are some things that computer animation does very, very effectively. Um, the stuff of the toys and uh, Andy's room and so forth is charming and very believable. Uh, the human characters, I think, are somewhat less successful, and they don't have the kind of warmth that you can create with a hand-drawn character. And also, I don't think... Uh, Toy Story was a success because it's the first computer film where the people went to see the technology. I think it was a successful film because they had such a well-put-together story um, that was told so effectively. And as long as you can give people, you know, a good story well told, I think you'll have a successful film. Well, now, what about animation in the shorter films? I'm thinking about, uh, I don't know whether they were Warner Brothers Films, you know the little, the little, well, the ones we used to see Saturday afternoon and uh, oh, showed up on like television Bugs later. Bunny and, and uh, Yosemite Sam and so forth. Right, that kind of stuff. Are, are those still being put out? Um, very few of them. That's a, a very sad story of short-sightedness on the part of the studio management back in the fifties. Um, in the in up until then, there'd been a practice in this country known as block booking. You know, if you were a theater owner and wanted uh, the equivalent of Star Wars from my studio, you would also have to take um, a second feature and a newsreel and a cartoon and maybe a serial. Well, in around 1950, the Supreme Court declared that practice illegal. 
And up until then, the animated films like the Bugs Bunny shorts and so forth had been paid for by a percentage of revenues from the rentals of the whole package. Well, at that point, theater owners were very eager to get in as many shows as they could, and they wanted to shorten the program, so they wouldn't pay very much for the cartoons. And they realized that a cartoon had gotten expensive enough to make that it couldn't earn back its total cost on its first release. What they didn't realize is that a good cartoon can be re-released essentially forever. Um, as we know, you know, you look at one of the Bugs Bunny cartoons from the early 50s today, and it's still hysterical. And people still love them, and they're mm. on TV, and they're on cassettes, and they're on laser discs. And so the, um, the studio owners closed their studios, and uh, that was pretty much the demise of the, uh, the animated short cartoon. Oh. Has it, has it been tougher as an animator to get work these days then and over the past several years than, than there used to be? The, uh, are there fewer of them working? Uh, no, these days there are more of them working. The success of the recent Disney features has gotten a lot of people in Hollywood saying, hey, they're making a lot of money on this medium. So in addition to Disney, you have um, uh, DreamWorks with Katzenberg and Spielberg and Geffen. Uh, Warner Brothers formed an animation unit not too long ago that's working on a couple features. Uh, Don Bluth is supposed to be working on at least two features for uh, Fox in Phoenix. And so for the first time in many years, it's really a seller's market for animators. And now the top animators uh, you know, can pretty much call their own shots and they're bid on uh, by the different studios, and they go where they want to work, depending on what, uh, who's offering the most money and who's offering, more often, the most interesting projects. So um, after many years of drought, suddenly animators are very much in demand, and one of the limits on how many animated features we see is the fact that there simply aren't that many really good animators, the kind of artist who can take a character like uh, Beast or Pocahontas and make that character act through an entire film believably. Um, there are very few artists who can do that, and so that kind of puts a, a cap on how many quality animated films uh, that can be made at this point. Was Walt Disney, was he the first to, uh, to do the kind of animation I'll see if I can phrase this right. You probably know what I'm going to ask anyway, and maybe I don't even have to finish the question, but uh, they were not animating the same way before Disney as they did as they have done since. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I just, I, I wondered the, how he, you know, the, the, the kind of, uh, I don't know, looking ahead or the, the kind of uh, per perception he had to know that this was going to work out because nobody had done it quite the way he had done it. No, uh, Disney was someone who always wanted to take risks and go a step further and see what was beyond. He never wanted to repeat anything. That interview was just getting started. I checked the archives and could not find another tape that may have included the remainder of it. But I thought what was covered was very enjoyable. Gee, whomever booked Norm's show always did a great job. Please like, subscribe, and share from whichever platform you're listening on. Until next week, closing the vault and riding those animated pages home. For Migrating Birds, San Juan Capistrano, St. Patrick, Motown, Community Auditions, Breaking in New Producers, Illustrious Radio Careers, Richard Dreyfus, Riverdance, the former Henry Moscovich. Sidewalk Games, Schlemiels and Schlemazels, Philip Roth, Lord Briscoe, Senor Selimene, High Speed Trains, Old Time Radio, Henry Morgan, Fred Allen, Jack Benny, Fibber McGee and Molly, Burns and Allen, Vic and Sade, Bob and Ray, Lenny Sogoloff and Lenny's on the Turnpike, Tierra del Fuego, Midnight Blue, Speed Anderson, Sandys and Beverly, Steve Daly, Charles Solomon, Walt Disney, Pixar, Dave Bowers, Tom Howie, Mike Cannon, Marilyn Gorelnik, and the host of the hippest radio show in the nation, Norm Nathan, I'm 
Tony Nesbitt.